You're listening to Music Tectonics. Welcome to Music Tectonics, where we go beneath the surface of music and technology, where data and music run off to a bedroom studio for a fling, where the music industry is caught on camera making deals with the devil, and where everyone shows up to dinner parties with little holograms on themselves in their backpack, just in case it's that type of party. I'm your host, Dimitri Vitsa, the founder and CEO of Rock Paper Scissors, a PR firm that specializes in music, tech, and music tech. This episode, I'm super pumped to have Danny Deal on the line with me. She's a producer, DJ, and public speaker. She's the writer at The Verge that covers the intersection of music and technology. She heads up the YouTube series, The Future of Music, and she's the vice president of the Recording Academy Chicago chapter. Yeah, clearly I, I don't do much at all. <laughs> been love loving reading your stuff in the verge over the past year um and uh keep me on my toes i've got to be thinking about mm. these and, and you really push the kind of push the envelope on on how people are talking about the music industry and music and tech so it's so awesome that you're on the show i'm excited it's been really interesting over the past year because there aren't a lot of people that operate in the space of music and tech within journalism and there are even fewer people that are in the, that space that speak to a broader audience in a way that anyone can understand if they're not already familiar with those topics. So that's really where I try to lie. That's a really good point. I think that's why I enjoy reading your stuff so much because I, we, you know, at Rock Paper Scissors, we always focus on being intelligent but accessible. That's how mm -hmm. our, that's like our writing style and our approach to telling stories. So I think that's why I've been digging what you write so much. So check this out, Danny. Um, a couple of episodes ago, we focused on one of our seismic shifts. We talk about these seismic shifts that are changing everything in music, like the way innovation and technology are impacting one, uh, impacting the industry, and. Um, uh, the, the one we focused on was uses will remain faster than systems. And towards the end of the episode, we started to get a little bit into AI and music. But back in the spring, you did a panel at Winter Music Conference and you did an article a little bit about this. Um, mm -hmm. And so I wanted to get your take on AI and music, especially Ooh. around music, music generation. Um, and uh, I think it's really interesting. I think it's relevant to the fact that things are changing so quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I feel like a lot of people in the more traditional music industry, including um, you know songwriters and musicians, performers, are really threatened by AI and music. So you're a, a DJ and producer. Um, you've put recordings out, and mm -hmm. I'm really curious to get your take on should people be nervous about AI and music? I think both can be true. I think some people should be nervous, and I think a lot of people can look at it as an opportunity to enhance their music-making abilities. I don't think that it has to be one or the other. I think both are going to exist at the same time. But it is interesting, the different case use scenarios that I'm seeing pop up. I got a pitch the other day for an AI DJ software that will help me pick songs from my track list to create a playlist so that I can focus on performing without having to worry about what songs I'm going to play. And I was so offended by the idea of this software even existing. <laughs> Uh, so it's for it, DJs to create their set list? Yes, so that you don't have to worry about that portion. You can focus on entertaining the crowd. So like moving your hands around and stuff like that? Exactly, right. Jumping up and down, yeah, doing fist bumps, leading the audience and hand waves, that's, things like that. Okay, so Danny, mm -hmm. that's really interesting because some of the AI platforms and apps are suggesting that they help people compose music. So mm -hmm. people who are songwriters... Mm -hmm. um, that are not on the producer side, but literally, you know, literally like may maybe an acoustic song or something, they see news about one of these AI generative apps mm -hmm. and they start to feel like, well, maybe, um, you know, the, the vision of these uh, founders is that there won't be need for humans to create that's, music again. That's entirely not true. I think it is going to potentially replace some session musicians in some instances, it might replace some musicians who create background clips of music for advertisements, things where music can be passable and sit in the background. You're not really paying much attention to it, but you need something to fill that space. And that's where I'm seeing it be the most successful right now. Can AI create a pop hit on its own that you could put on the radio and people would consume and think was amazing? It can't do that. You think never? 
I think we're a very long way from that being any sort of a potential reality. And I would never say never because some of the things that have even happened at this point in time, I would have not thought would be possible 15 or 20 years ago. You know, since you probably use digital workstations to create music, mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I've identified as another seismic shift is music production is in the hands of the masses. And to me, the, the digital audio workstation is really the first real breakthrough of giving people a much, a much broader group of people access to the tools to make mm -hmm. recordings, produce and, and make recordings. And, you know, that's going back quite several years at this point. And we're still, I think, seeing the side effects of more and more people creating music. We're, t we're hearing like reports that Spotify's seeing 40,000 um, releases uh, a day at this point, yes. which is an insane quantity. It used mm -hmm. to be about that much per year. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I, I would argue that this, some of the AI apps or any of the music creation apps that, that kind of simplify um, creating music, if you don't know an instrument or don't know s hardware or, or don't have musical theory or whatever, mm -hmm. are actually increasing the music production side, giving access to more people who you wouldn't have thought of as artists before. Absolutely. So, so when I hear musicians say, feel threatened by this, I also say, well, but wait a minute, there's a lot of people who never actually could use this creative part of themselves because they didn't ever learn those tools or, or theories or, or um, composition, things like that, who all of a sudden they feel like, oh, I have a way to make music. Right. And also to build upon that, another trend that I'm seeing with software is that they are backing away from using traditional music theory terms and instead trying to figure out an alternative language that the masses can understand. So instead of saying, for example, oh, what was the piece of software? A friend of mine said he has a piece of software that will go through his playlist and will organize his songs according to quote unquote energy levels. So it will scan his playlist, the lower energy tracks, i.e. the ones that are possibly slower, have uh Maybe they're like deep house tracks, the drops are not as intense, whatever would qualify a track as having less energy, it'll put and sort at the bottom. And then the big bangers, it'll put at the top. And energy is a term that anyone can understand and approach, whereas a lot of the DAWs right now still have terms where if you do not know music theory, you really have to spend the time to invest and learn the interface. So if, if there was a spectrum of people who felt like these AI apps or other, other types of apps and platforms that cr give non-musicians a way of creating music. Um, okay. But first of all, what is a non-musician? It feels very gatekeeper-y, right? Yeah. Because what, what is a musician? There's, there are people out there that can write amazing melodies, but they don't know what a 4-4 signature is. They don't know the difference between how to write something in a major key and then transposing it to a minor. And uh, yeah, so the, if there's a spectrum of people who are making music creation mm -hmm. accessible, mm -hmm. saying, okay, this stuff is making music creation, or this is threatening uh, musicians or the music industry, where do you fall on that spectrum? I mean, like I said, I think it's both. And I think it's both because I think... AI is going to assist musicians. It is also in some cases going to be the musician. And I, over time, I think it will ultimately create more opportunity than it will take away. There are a couple of reports that have come out this year that certainly indicate that's the case. There was a report from the World Economic Forum that said that AI is expected to create 133 million new roles. It will displace 75 million roles by 2022, but it will create 133 million new roles in its place. It, with every new technology that comes along, people are displaced. It changes the medium, but more often than not, it does not out outmode it completely. Yes, this will be interesting to see. And um, I was talking to Gigi Johnson at UCLA, who also has a podcast, Innovating Music. And 
she, in fact, on this, this podcast, um, she had, um, she was talking about how she felt like she would go into record labels and see people whose jobs had a lot to do with Excel spreadsheets or, or Google sheets. And she said, those are the ones that are going to be disp displaced. All that data mm -hmm. is, uh, is going to be processed through machine learning and AI. Um, and they're the ones that need to get ahead of the curve on that. And I think it really is about maybe retraining or, or changing what your role might be within the industry. Sure. Um, to that point, we are seeing AI being used in very inventive ways within the music industry, like AR. Uh, um, there, are, there are certain companies that are using machine learning and AI to help pick out who the next superstars are going to be and scout for new talent that way. Yeah. So there's that whole internal industry side mm -hmm. of AI use, data, um, data use that doesn't have to do with composition or performance. Um, that, uh, yeah, I mean, even just, you know, like matching up licensing data, rights data, things like that as well. Mm -hmm. um, looking at the likelihood of whether the metadata is correct or not, and then correcting the metadata, from there, oh boy. <laughs> you know, after some machine has already done the, you know, 90% of the work mm -hmm. or something like that. I know you've written about metadata as well. So. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's a whole nother, uh, deep dive. To yeah, get we in. Lots of cans of worms all together. So, you know, in your piece last spring about AI, you were looking at some of the, the, like the, the missing legal underpinnings. And I wonder if we could get into that a little bit. Oh goodness. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was so fascinating. The The only reason why I was interested in copyright and artificial intelligence to begin with was because of that conference earlier in the year at Winter Music Conference in Miami that you had alluded to. So there was one particular person, the CTO of Isotope, and he said, I won't mince words. This is a total legal clusterfuck when he was referring right. to copyright and AI. And I that just made me curious. Why? Why is this a legal clusterfuck? I, I didn't understand why people were alarmed. And so I wanted to look into it. And then my other good friend, Matt Aminetti, who is one of the founders of Splice, uh, filled me in a little bit. And what I found was truly shocking. So yeah, what'd you find? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that first of all, that it's not something new. The first recorded instance that I found of the Copyright Office being alerted to the potential dangers of AI-generated music was back in 1965, and it was ignored. And mm. right, generally what I find with law is that we have to get to a tipping point where something egregious has happened that the general public can no longer ignore it. And that's how we wind up with someone like, Mark Zuckerberg testifying in front of Congress. And that's when mm -hmm. laws really start to affect and change and try to be retroactive about terrible things that have already happened. So I'm kind of worried that we're that's what's going to happen when it comes to AI and copyright. We've been talking about it for over 50 years. Nothing has happened. There's probably going to have to be some big, splashy case that will make the public sit up and think, whoa, this is something that we have to pay attention to. So when I think about what are the potential crises that could happen from mm -hmm. this, um, I think of kind of two categories. One of them you pointed out, which is uh, you, your, your article early in says, what happens if AI software trains solely on Beyonce creates a track that sounds just mm -hmm. like her? And so I would say one category would be AI makes what's kind of like fake. It's like fake music, right? right. <laughs> um, deep fake music. Uh, AI makes something that as far as you could tell, it would be, it, you assume it was some famous star. Sure. Um, just because it's analyzed their music, analyzed their voice, analyzed their lyrics, mm -hmm. and then created something that they did not create, but basically has that identity, sonic identity. Right. And that's where things start to get a little muddy because there are different parts of law that would either ignore the specific instance or would protect it. So if something like that happened and the AI was marketed to be in the style of Beyonce or a Beyonce copycat, then there would potentially be a law 
that would protect Beyonce's persona. But that's a state by state law. It's not a federal law. The other thing that you're alluding to is this particular AI creating music that is in the style of an existing musician. And law generally is very reluctant to protect things that are in the style of. The AI would have to create a song that very specifically sounds like an existing Beyonce song for there to be anything to prosecute. So if the tempo is different and it's in a different key and the topic's different, even if the timbre of the voice is similar, it would probably stand on its own? Potentially. Legally? I, music yeah. copyright and law is a very, very sticky place in general, as we just saw with the whole Katy Perry Dark Horse scenario. Right. Uh, right. And we just haven't had to contend with this at all. We- so so here's... Here's my second category, Danny, mm-hmm. which is, so now there's these apps where you can create music easily. Sure. Um, so you have a new kind of generation of creators who might be able to use this, create tracks, mm-hmm. release them in the wild or even in the economy, <laughs> more, 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 um, stru- you know, uh, more, more formally, uh, like as a, as a release recording, who owns, who owns it? We is don't it know. That- we don't program know. the software or right. is it the person that pressed a couple of buttons and spit out a song? Yeah, this is literally the conversation that I had with Meredith Rose, who is a policy lawyer. And she said that trying to get to the nut of that question is about as existential as you can get with copyright law, because you have to decide whether AI can qualify under legal personhood or not. And we've assigned legal personhood in the past to things that are not people. It just makes it easier in some instances. If you want to, for example, sue somebody, if you want to sue somebody that works on a ship, it is much easier to sue the ship than to find the particular person that works on that ship and to sue them. So we've given ships legal personhood. We've given corporations legal personhood. There is Mm -hmm. some debate over whether that is good or not, but it's possible we could say that AI can have the status of legal personhood and thus be the actual author of the music that it creates. We have no precedent for that currently. There's nothing to force that decision also. Well, could it be related to the terms and services of the platform or app that you use to create the music? I mean, what do you mean by that? Isn't it as simple as you're going to use this app to create music? The app says in order to use this app, you need to follow these terms and services and uh, terms of services. And the terms are, we own 50% of the rights to any songs created using our software. Potentially. I also don't think that just because you sign a TOS means it is legal. (laughs) Um, (laughs) As we found out with SoundCloud last year, um, Mm. their terms of service for self-monetization very clearly was not okay. And after I wrote a report on it, they revised the entire contract within 48 hours. And actually the Verge's editor-in-chief, Neil I. Patel, has a very spicy take that terms of service should just be outlawed outright, that we should not have them. Um, and, and how do we protect the users if we outlaw terms of service? I know. It Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying that's incorrect. I'm, I'm also kidding. saying, I'm not saying that I agree or disagree with him. I'm, this is a very hotly contested topic within The Verge or terms of service. But the problem is, is that terms of service in some instances can protect the user, but sometimes they take advantage of the user because what are they banking on? The fact that you're just going to scroll to the bottom and click accept because there is 10 pages of nonsense that you don't have the time to read. Exactly. And, uh, and if an entire industry is using the same practices, it's very hard for the user to find an option where they could say, you know what, I'm going to use the one that differentiates by protecting my rights, mm-hmm. um, rather than protect the rights of the company. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's only been a very recent trend that people are aware of how their data is stored and shared. That's something that we gave away for a very, very long time until it got to a breaking point where we realized that our entire lives were being bought and sold online. Yes. Uh, 
to the dark part of the conversation, right? <laughs> <laughs> so but. Um, going back to, um, you know, whether AI or any kind of music creation software um, could be taking away work or livelihood from artists. Um, one of the, one of the shifts that I've been thinking about a lot is that music is competing with everything. Mm -hmm. And I first noticed it with video games to me, like when Farmville, actually not even video games, like smartphone games, app store games, when, when far, or that was a Facebook game, wasn't it? Farmville, when Farmville came out and all of a sudden it was like millions of people who had never played a video game were like spending hours and hours a day, uh, building their farms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, um, I was like, well, wait, that means they're not listening to music, you know? Mm. And the, the video game explosion, I think a lot now, um, you know, has, has, I think also had something to do with that. The, the explosion of uh, streaming of TV and film, I think also is a lot of competition, but also the little, the little app games, you know, all the, I, I mean, you can call them video games, but they feel a little bit different than when you have a console game. Do you, are you um, alluding like to, a, do you feel that people were consuming more music as a hobby or passively? before these other forms I of entertainment came along? That's, I, guess, I guess that's what I'm curious about. I mean, certainly in terms of cultural mind share, mm -hmm. there's a lot more you can choose for entertainment. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I was a teenager, music, and I, and I wasn't like, um, you know, I wasn't like a deep crate digger or anything like that. I played music. Um, I also juggled and rode my bike and, you know, did a lot of other stuff. Um, and it just, it just seemed like music had this special, almost like sacred space in childhood and teenagehood, early adulthood that is now, um, that type of space is, is competing with social media and video games and TV and film. I mean, yeah. And YouTube, you have access to so much other types of content, whereas music kind of had this, this special cultural location in, in, in lifestyle. Okay. I Can I, I say bugging? something that I think on the one hand might bum you out, but also will <laughs> reframe it and give you hope for the future? Uh -huh. Are you 33 or older? Yes. Okay. So statistically, you are beyond the point in your life where you start to search for and accept new forms of music and start to retroactively put nostalgia in a rosy lens and look back toward your formative years and say, huh, wasn't music so much better back then? There are studies that back this up. I don't 33 that, is the age. Huh? Yeah, no, I, I know that. I yeah, know, I know that sure. and I believe it. I, I spent a lot, a lot of time. I'm, I'm, um, I'm in my late forties. Mm. So I've spent a lot of time still discovering music in my, in my thirties and early forties. But interestingly, just in the past year or two, I've spent more time playing music mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, and more music is being I, consumed than ever before. And I think part of it has to do with these new platforms. If you look at genres mm -hmm. like K-pop, it wouldn't have existed without YouTube. I think there's an argument for that. There's Well, when I say music is competing with everything, uh, you know, I would say K-pop is as much about dance and fashion as it is about music. Absolutely it is, <laughs> which is why it thrives on a social media platform that also embraces yeah. video. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so, um, I actually don't feel threatened by any of this stuff, Danny. I don't feel threatened. I don't think, I don't even think artists should feel threatened by AI generative mus music. I think they should think about new tools and new opportunities to create things that have never been created before. I mean, if you've been playing a stringed instrument with no effects for 20 or 30 years, mm -hmm. uh, it might be time to introduce some other op opportunities, some additional things. Uh, well, I know here. that's that. How that, do you feel about the fact that a major label signed an algorithm and is releasing algorithmic material and gave the people that wrote that software 600 songwriting credits? I personally don't have a problem you with it. You don't have I a mean, problem like with it? I don't have a problem with it. No, I think, you know, I'm not, it's, I, I don't ha I don't, major record labels don't owe me anything. You know what I mean? Like I can buy things. I cannot buy things. I can turn things on. I can turn things off. Um, so I don't actually, <laughs> I don't actually have a problem with that. Um, you know, I think artists, um, there are so many artists that, that, some of them are going to succeed and some of them are not, mm -hmm. you know, and we all live in the same 
world operate in the same uh, way in which, and, and, you know, this is not a pull yourself up by the bootstraps conversation, but I feel like from an artistic perspective, you can do two things. You can create art because it makes you satisfied and fulfilled, Mm -hmm. or you can do it because it makes somebody else (laughs) satisfied or fulfilled. And you can do both as well. And, you know, I think I, I'm not, I'm not in support of situations in which it feels like an artist or any individual or any entity is at a disadvantage or is somehow being negotiated under pressure, um, losing value for what they do because of a, a power dynamic. But I also think, um, as an artist myself, not a, not a professionally recording artist, I think if I want to make it, I just have to create something that captures some audience, some mind share that, that engages people's souls and figure out ways to monetize it. And so, yeah, I do. <laughs> do you have a problem with a major label licensing and giving song credits to AI? I think it is a dangerous precedent because there were six people that wrote this software and they were able to create 600 tracks with very minimal effort and very little time. But is anyone listening to them? I haven't checked on the stats in a while, but <laughs> whether whether this particular experiment by the label is a success or not, I think is beside the point because like I said, they have set a precedent and it's an inflection point for the music industry for us to sit back and say, a major label made the decision to distribute and monetize automated audio and gave six people 600 songwriting credits that admittedly have never written a song in their entire lives and do not know how to write songs. So it's going to happen again. And oh yeah, I like I, it has nothing, whether this project tanks or not is not even something that should be discussed. It's the idea and the precedent because it's going to happen. Yeah. I, I guess I would, I would almost put that quote music mm-hmm. in another category. You know, so it's almost like it's a new format or new form. It's a new form of audio. Um, and so they're going to be, I think a lot of people are not going to listen to it. Are you talking about, are we talking, are you st- stepping back and talking about the genre that this stuff exists in? Is that what you're talking about? Like how it's more. <laughs> I was actually just talking about machine made music. Oh, do you think that there should be a disclosure? Oh, I don't know. No, I don't. <laughs> I don't think anybody needs more requirements about how they talk about their own <laughs> creations, even if they're software developers. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> I more think that sonically speaking, something different mm-hmm. is happening with that particular catalog and it will have a limited audience and that's okay. <laughs> you know, if do it you, was knocking people off the billboard. Why do you think it will have a limited audience? If it was knocking people off the charts, like the streaming charts or the billboard charts or whatever, it feels more, it feels more threatening. But I also think human. But that's what I'm talking about is getting, we only tend to think about these things when we get to a after. worst case scenario. Right. If, right. if AI was at the point of a little Nas X and an AI generated song blocked Taylor Swift from number one, people would be pissed. Well, Taylor they Swift would be, would be pissed. <laughs> I mean, Taylor Swift is pissed a lot. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think little Nas X would be pissed. I think he'd probably just use one of the apps and make another meme. <laughs> I agree with that too. <laughs> I mean, he, but I think a lot of people would feel really uncomfortable about that. Yeah, I think so too. You know, my thing is, uh, I, I'm I'm not. I don't listen to a ton of pop music. You know, I I, mm-hmm. I have acknowledged that I like a little bit stranger music, a little weirder, a little more eclectic. Um, mm-hmm. I'm really into timbre, so I listen like pe- mm. you know, like people are listening to genres. I'm listening to timbres. I'm like, what's that buzzy stuff? I want more buzzy, mm-hmm. stuff, you know. Um, and so I don't know. For me, through that lens, frequently I look at a lot of pop music as if um, you know, it's not purely about the music anyway. It's so much about so many other things. So. Um, you well, know, and there's have you, generation. Have you explored the, it's an app called Mubert, M-U-B-E-R-T. Yeah, I did. You told me about it. <laughs> oh, right. What did you think? I thought so, it was okay. really interesting. A, a primer for the people that are listening. This is an app that was pitched to me where it will endlessly generate forms of electronic music. So you can choose different channels like house or techno or hip hop and just leave it on forever. And it will continue to create and morph into different sorts of beats, but it will infinitely create one long string of music for you. And it's pretty good. Yeah. What do you think of it? Will you listen to it? I think it's it's really good. 
Um, it's one of the best that I've heard. I'll be honest. I subscribed to their premium account the other day mm -hmm. <laughs> because, I, because I wanted to try the other features and, and because I knew we'd be having this conversation and because mm -hmm. I also knew that you'd be emceeing the AI's Got Talent show at mm -hmm. Tectonics, our conference in October in LA. And I had mentioned we've got three participants, um, mm -hmm. Amadeus Code, Song.ai, and uh, Boomi, all mm -hmm. AI-related music creation, very different, all three very different. And we need one or two more. And you suggested Moober. They got in touch. I downloaded it. I play with it. So I'm curious to hear from our listeners who else we should be considering for this talent show that you're going to be emceeing, Danny? <laughs> mm. I, I also think Sony Flow Machines should get in the mix. All right. What are they, tell me about them. And that's a, it's a plugin. It kind of operates like the Captain plugins in a DAW. Do you know about Captain plugins? I don't. Okay. So it's a trio of plugins that it's, what is it? Captain Bass, Captain Chords, and Captain Melody. So I can have it generate a bass line. I can throw that MIDI in. Then I can connect chords with bass. And then it will generate chords that will match to go on top of the bass. And then I can do the same thing in Daisy Chain Melody to the chords to the bass. And then because they're all linked with each other, if I change anything in any one of those three plugins, the other two will adapt to make sure that whatever change I'm making, everything else will still stay in key and sound coherent. So it's like the little drum button on the old Casios, right? I don't know. I never had an old Casio. Oh, I'm being facetious, but just any any of the keyboards that have like a rhythm, like you just play a drum track and then you start playing with it. Yeah, except this does all the work for you. And it actually creates pretty good melodies. So then can you release a song with that? Sure. And whose is it? It's mine. It's not theirs. Um, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Are you cheating? But Sony yeah. float... <laughs> I, I don't think so. I think a lot of a lot of AI is meant to be a stepping stone or the way they're pitching it, it's meant to be a stepping stone so that you can connect what's in your head to what is on the screen faster, or it can provide a point of inspiration. So even if I generate a melody for a song, that's probably not where my end product is going to end up, but it might spark an idea and I can use that as a tangent to start exploring and go off in different directions. Do you think you need to disclose that on your recordings? <laughs> no. Do I need to disclose that I use Ozone? No. <laughs> <laughs> Do I need to disclose that I use Waves plugins? Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, it's interesting to hear where you draw the line. But you know what? This has been fun. <laughs> <laughs> as long as it belongs to me, the human, at the end of the day. <laughs> right. No, but... Um, but yeah, no, it is, it's, it's really, there's, there's a lot of nuance. I don't presume to have all the answers. I don't, I know that I have definite feelings about it. I know it invokes a lot of emotion in me in certain parts of this conversation. Right. I know there are things that I inherently feel are not right. And at the end of the day, nobody really knows where the line is. And we have yeah. nothing in our legal system to account for what the line is. Yeah. We'll that's... all have to collectively agree at some point in the future, though. Yeah. This is really interesting. I mean, I think this this is why I wanted to do the AI's Got Talent thing and why I wanted mm -hmm. you as the MC because I feel like you are, you see both sides of it. You lean mm -hmm. into it, but you also question some of the ethical direction this could head. Um, and part of the goal was we could talk about AI um, we could do a legal discussion or an ethical discussion um, or just pitches or whatever, but I thought it would be really cool for people to just experience it. Sure. Um, and, yeah. you know, we'll lead into a discussion once we, once we get to hear what people are creating with AI, uh, how much, how much of a human element there is, how much does the human need to bring in terms of existing education knowledge practice versus just pick up this tablet app and start playing with mm -hmm. it and it still sounds good. And then what does that mean? Which ones will be like lighter uses that are almost like I mentioned on a previous podcast, um, one of our participants, Boomy, I think is could lean into almost like being like an emoji, a musical emoji so that you can create it so quickly. It's so easy and light that you just add it to whatever your social expression is. Mm. Um, 
versus the Amadeus code, which uh, in its current iteration feels more like what you were describing with those plugins where it's like you start with it it gives you yeah. ideas and then you start replacing the voices into your own um, but it's just more like an idea generation piece more complex mm -hmm. than that, so this will yeah. be fun so danny did your um did the uh, future of music launch a new season it did it just started and our first episode is about eric prids who is a swedish dj producer icon legend and his new hollow spear which debuted at tomorrowland but we have so many episodes coming up that are filled with rock stars we have one with production duo andres and mauricio who are the guys that were behind producing despacito and they have a splice sample pack and the episode is all about how they embrace the world of sampling and how sampling marketplaces have really closed boundaries around the world with the access for the types of sounds that producers have in their bedrooms. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. And then we have Charlie XCX too, talking about how streaming has disrupted the album cycle. You'll really like that one. Ooh, that does mm -hmm. sound good. Hmm. I'm excited to have you at Music Tectonics. Um, so glad we could have this conversation. If people want to find you, what is dannydeal.com the best place? Oh yeah. I am the easiest person to find. It is my name on every social platform, Twitter, Instagram, you name it. Just Danny Deal. We're going to have to have you back on the show again too. I'm going to make you come back on sometime. If I can get you scheduled, you're always flying around shooting video. Okay. Look, turning the tables on you, you were also flying a lot recently. <laughs> we're just very busy people. <laughs> Good point. Yeah. <laughs> so thanks for joining the show, Danny. Looking forward to seeing you in LA October 28th and 29th. Yes, same. And thank you for listening to the Music Tectonics podcast. Hit subscribe on whatever kind of AI-driven podcast app you're listening to so you can hear about upcoming episodes. Check out musictectonics.com to not only follow the podcast, but we also have original blog posts. And get onto our newsletter for the Music Tectonics Conference, which is taking place October 28th and 29th in Los Angeles, California, 2019. Um, and if you sign up for the newsletter, you get a $50 discount on the badges. Stay tuned. We'll be back with new episodes. You're listening to Music Tectonics.